Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Ba -da -ba. I will t Let me tell you this, Andy. Let me start with this. Oh, oh go ahead. So, you know, this week uh, we had the... Um, Speakeasy. I just do went know live that. a couple a couple of days ago uh, with Matt Gradstar, and that was a a fun conversation about Casino Royale. And in Casino Royale, when we recorded that, I made mention of the fact that I was reading the book. Do you remember that? I do. Now, of course, we recorded this thing some time ago because of schedules and how things work uh, on the internet. And so, at the time we recorded it, I had yet to finish 
Casino Royale. I have now done so. And what's your report? I highly recommend that book. I know I'm only about 50 years late. Uh, coming, <laughs> coming <to laughs> hey, at least awareness. you read it. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's a spanking good book. I learned a lot about James Bond, and I I would like to officially double down on my um, impression that this this version of Casino Royale, this Bond, is the best interpretation of Bond book to screen that I have seen. The best adaptation and interpretation of that character. I that he just nailed it. Do you do you have you read many other books? I am three quarters of the way through uh, Live and Let Die. Gotcha. I oddly, I just started watching that movie. Really? Yes. What do you think of it so far? Well, I mean, I've seen it before. I mean, I enjoy it. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> but uh, the so only you're book new that, to this Bond thing, are you? The only. <laughs> The only book that I have read is Goldfinger, mm. which, as I recall, I mean, it's been years since I read it, but my recollection is that it was incredibly uh, in step with the film. Mm. I have not done that yet. So far, Live and Let Die appears also to be in step with the film. I'm doing it. What I love is doing it on this Kindle thing. You know, have you heard of this thing called the Kindle? Tell me about it. What's really delightful about it, and this is, you know, and sometimes I make use of this, but not always. I, I'm just plowing through, I want to plow through the Bond books, and what's so great about it is it tells me which one's next. At the oh. end, you know, it says, okay, you finish this just one. Like, yeah, like the movie credits do. Exactly. So now you need to read this one. And so uh, it's uh, it was super useful. I think there are only like 16 of them that are official um, uh, Fleming Books, so I, I'm not. I don't know. I have the other. I have the most recent one, uh, obviously that he didn't read. That only came out a couple of years ago. What was the last one that he wrote? Do you know, <laughs> I, off the top of your I head? don't know. I told you, I'm only on number two, Andy. I'll be able to tell you in about 14 books. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'm going in order. Don't spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> that is too funny. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know what happens. <laughs> anyway, I I'm really enjoying this, and I feel like it's uh, not, this is this is my thing for this year. I want to wrap up all these books. Nice. I can't remember a year where I read uh, where I was able to read a complete series like that. And I read kind of a lot of books, but I tend to jump around, and so this is going to be tough. To plow well, through. at least these, as uh, my recollection again, going off of Goldfinger. They're relatively short. That is really, that's very true. They're all like, you know, have you heard of this thing, the Kindle? One of the other things that I like about this Kindle, <laughs> if you haven't heard of it. Tell me all about it. At the bottom of this, it's an ebook reader. You can read books electronically uh, on your mobile device or your Kindle e-reader. It's really a fascinating device. It's, it, I, I think there are big things ahead for this that's technology. Exciting. At the bottom, <laughs> At the bottom of the page... At the bottom of, the, of each uh, of the pages, it will tell you, you know, how many minutes are left in this chapter based on your reading speed. And at the beginning of when you first open the book, it says, you know, kind of, and I don't know if, if this one is based on my reading speed or just average reading speed of all readers. It'll tell you how long. They're like, st- like three, five, five-hour books. Like, they're not long books. I could sit down and feel like I could get through one in a, in a day. I never have a day to sit and read and, you know, drink things and, and read some more. But, you know. They're pretty quick. Nice. I might. Uh, I might have to pick those up and uh, check them out myself. You should pick up a Kindle if you haven't uh, experienced this technology. Have you? Tell, tell me have about. I told that. you about the Kindle. <laughs> Shall we tell the people where we're from? <laughs> where are we from? the next reel on radishpixel.fm everybody i'm pete wright and that right there is andy nelson hello and we spoil movies tonight on the show the first in our series on great films and their remakes with fred zinnemann's 1952 western classic high noon before we get into that you should learn more about us at the next subscribe to the show on itunes and follow us on twitter and facebook at the next reel and if you've ever found yourself watching the clock waiting for someone to end your sweet sweet misery and just stop the movie you're watching right at that very moment 
you should head over to the Next Reel's Instagram, hashtag PonyPrize, hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And with that, let's head on over to Scotland and check in with Stephen Smart, who is currently dealing out some fisticuffs to his whiny deputy. Hey guys, last week's movie featured Paul Newman as Billy the Kid. The Left-Handed Gun from 1958, uh, directed by Arthur Penn, and also starring John Daner as Pat Garrett. At Brendo61 guessed it on Image 5, so congrats, you are entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts Monday, so thanks guys, and see you later. We have no blot spot this week. Netflix fail, hashtag Netflix fail. Didn't get in the movie in time. Sorry, Ben. We're, we're probably probably it was coming straight for me, and I said, "Sorry." <laughs> it's your fault. It's the only high noon it's, in it's rotation. The one copy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean it's uh, the edge, Pete? The edge. Oh, that's right. That's right. I'm behind. So it's the edge. That is. That actually seems feels much more appropriate. <laughs> um, you should start signing them just in really inconspicuous places. Like find a little code. <laughs> Let's see if you see. can pass it on. That'd be pretty funny. Be <laughs> I funny. think it's time, Andy. Let's <laughs> do trailers. I was really tempted to torture you with the teaser for Nine Lives today. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know about that one, right? Well, I, I have it. This is the, is this the Jennifer Garner? Well, yes, she's in it, but Kevin... more specifically, it's it's Kevin Spacey. Yeah. It's it's basically is like Kevin Spacey uh, the cat? one of those old... He's the cat, <laughs> yes. And Christopher Walken is, I don't know, the guy who turns him into a cat to teach him a lesson. I don't think I I don't yeah. think I'm gonna watch that movie. No. But I, I think to be the fair, trailer I'm actually prob- says Kevin Spacey like you've never seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I don't think I'm in the target demographic. Oh dear. Well, I'm not sure who is in the target demographic <laughs> because it's like I don't think Kevin Spacey fans nor Christopher Walken fans want to see either of them in that film. <laughs> and I don't think my kids care that Kevin Spacey or Christopher Walken are in it. So I'm not quite sure who they're targeting there. Oh, oh my, my, That's my. good. That's pretty good. Well, I'm yes, glad you didn't do that. What trailer did you do uh, in, uh, in the stead? Instead, I, uh, you know... I'm not sure. Did you see the movie Blue Ruin that came out last year or so? Was it a horror thing? Not really. It was more of a. It was more of kind of like an indie thriller mm. sort I've of. I've heard thing. of it. I did not uh, see it. Well, it was a, a quite a ride. I really, really enjoyed Blue Ruin, uh, directed by Jeremy Saulnier, I believe is how you say his name, and. Um, I just found this teaser. It's only a teaser right now for his new film called Green Room. So I think he's kind of going through a color spectrum thing. Blue Ruin, <laughs> Green Room. Curious to see. It's it's like his own Cornetto trilogy. That's good. Everybody yes. needs a hobby. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm really curious to see uh, this new one, Green Room. Not only am I curious because of uh, Jeremy Saulnier, who's directing it, but I'm also very curious because dear old Patrick Stewart one of the people who just seems like one of the nicest men on earth plays a despicable, uh, I think it's kind of like a skinhead sort of guy. Kind of looks like Walter just, White. Yes, it's <laughs> it's a very dark turn for for good old uh, Jean-Luc Picard. I, um, I, th- I You don't get a lot out of this. I had to go watch a few more little clips that you can find kind of poking around. There's a TIFF interview and stuff like that. And uh, trying to get a better sense of this real story here. And it just looks creepy. It, it has kind of the the intense uh, threats of violence going on, just like Blue Ruin did. Um, but this one specifically is about a young punk rock band who find themselves trapped in a secluded venue after stumbling upon a horrific act of violence. So I got to say, it's got all the pieces in place for me to uh, want to check it out. So I, I'm big on this one. What about you? What do you think I'm going to say? It's, I think you're going to say, ooh, icky horror. <laughs> I think I'm going to say it's not, it's not the highest on my list. I, I admit I was really curious if Patrick Stewart's going to, going to throw his hat into this kind of a film. I'm, I am, there is a non-zero chance that I will see this movie. Uh, I, well, I like yeah. that. I count that as a right. win. <laughs> 
uh, yeah, so I, I was uh, I was curious uh, about it. Uh, I was also, uh, uh, you know, I, I was not moved to go Fandango my tickets tonight. <laughs> is that, <laughs> probably is that fair? The best. I guess that's okay. I'll, I'll... <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's too funny. This one, um, the trailer says it opens Friday the 13th of May, but uh, I see April 15th. So anyway, it's going to be opening sometime in the next couple Friday months. the 13th. Isn't that a little on the nose? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that. Well, was. eventually you have to release a horror movie on Friday the Thirteenth. It can't all be comedies to kind of like <laughs> counter the date. ironic releases. <sighs> yeah. Oh dear! All right. Well, uh, my trailer is maybe my trailer is the ironic one because I'm not a big fan of horror, and yet I do pick the zombie films when I can. Uh, uh, my film is uh, Pandemic, which is really weird. <laughs> you know, it's got a. It, I feel like I'm on kind of a good stretch with the uh, with the independent uh, um, outbreak films, right? We we had a good run with uh, I Am Alone, with writers and directors of that film we had on this very show. It was great. Uh, I enjoyed right. that film. It was a super fun, uh, super fun romp. Uh, this one is, uh, you know, what are you going to do, Rachel Nichols? I just finished Continuum, the series, the sci fi series. I do like that Rachel Nichols. I think she's uh, she's a, a fine actress. And uh, seriously, man, Mikai Pfeiffer, the the, oh, yeah. the the guy we love to uh, love to not love that much, but Mikai, <laughs> <laughs> Paul Gilfoyle, uh, is in this thing. Missy Pyle. I mean, what's going on with these people in this movie? It is a uh, it is a first person. I, it looks to me like the whole thing is first person. So you take place, uh, you take a, the part of a character in this film and everybody's kind of rotating around you the whole thing. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's doom cam uh, and uh, that that probably dates me. Anyhow, uh, it I'm curious about it. It looks like it's got some good jump scares. It looks like it has some good zombies and uh, in, in this case disease-ridden hordes. Uh, and and I will probably see it out of curiosity. I, did it uh, inspire you at all? You know, not really. <laughs> I I wish that I could say it really intrigued me, but it uh, they this this attempt at filming a movie from a uh, first person point of view for the duration of a film has been done before. Mm-hmm. Um, Lady in the Lake, I believe, was the first attempt back in the fifties. It was a film noir, which is. Not a very strong film. Um, it's interesting to watch. It's interesting to kind of see as kind of just a study in cinema, but I didn't really care for the film itself. Um, oddly enough, there's another movie coming out um, very soon in the next couple of months called Hardcore Henry, uh, directed by Ilya Neischuler with uh, Charlton Copley in it. And again, it's the same thing. It's uh, this cyborg, who, and it's all told from the cyborg's point of view. Um, so it's strange that it's kind of like this resurgence of this technique. And I, I'm curious to see how they turn out because I'd like to see somebody be able to pull it off. I think it would be interesting if somebody was able to. Um, but this film, I don't know, for a film called Pandemic, it feels very um, restrictive to make it a first-person point of view. Here's my hunch. Uh, my hunch is we're going to have to get used to these kinds of films because this is VR filmmaking, right? This is going to be yes. the first plateau of VR filmmaking. It's not going to—you're not going to— And I actually—my my hunch uh, beta— that was hunch alpha. Hunch beta is we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> start with this uh, with this plateau on you are a member of of the cast, right? You're a part, you're taking part in the narrative, and then they'll figure out how to do VR, three sixty degree VR that is a a second person narrative or a third person narrative where we'll be able to to actually watch what's going on. We won't necessarily we'll be the omniscient cameraman that we we sort of also want to be. But I think there is this sort of um, nearly pornographic desire to take part in the film and uh, I think that that's going to be something we're going to have to get used to and and find a way to get excited about because it's going to be that's going to be the the next sort of step toward innovation in in actual sort of narrative technology and I'm I'm really curious about it I want to see somebody do it really well um you know I'm looking at some stills on hardcore henry right now and it's a kind of a the similar vibe it's just super violent and you know we'll see how well it how well 
we're able to take to not just watching violence but becoming violence. I think there's a different uh, there's a different vibe there, and I, I wonder if if that's something we're uh, you know that will be as easy to to grow accustomed to. Yeah, the VR uh, side of it is very interesting, and I'm curious. I, I mean, definitely the video game world has a lot of that. I'm curious to see how it transitions to film. And uh, this looks like, uh, if nothing else, it looks like it could be an interesting exploration of that. I think so, too. Between Pandemic and Hardcore Henry, both of them looks like they, they hit in April. Um, uh, Hardcore Henry has April 8th, and Pandemic is uh, just says April 2016 coming to, well, it says theaters, but we'll see. Uh, so there you go. That's mine. Andy, you're a good-looking boy. You've big, broad shoulders, but he is a man. And it takes more than big, broad shoulders to make a man. The judge has left town, Harvey's quit, and I'm having trouble getting deputies. People gotta talk themselves into law and order before they do anything about it. Maybe because down deep, they don't care. They just don't care. I think you better go while there's still time. It's better for you, and it's better for us. Amy. I mean it. If you won't go with me now, I'll be on that train when it leaves here. I've got to stay. Why must you be so stupid, Will? Have you forgotten what he is? Have you forgotten what he's done to people? Have you forgotten that he's crazy? Don't you remember when he sat in that chair and said, You'll never hang me. I'll come back. I'll kill you, Will Keen. I swear it. I'll kill you. A terror-stricken town left him to face four killers, single-handed, at high noon. High Noon, High Noon, 1952, directed by Fred Zinneman, uh, produced by Stanley Kramer and Carl Foreman, written by Carl Foreman, and um, based apparently simultaneously upon the story by John Cunningham called The Tin Star, stars Gary Cooper, Thomas Mitchell, Lloyd Bridges, Katie Jurado, Grace Kelly. And Lon Chaney, Otto Kruger, lots of uh, fantastic people we will be talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a Western, sure enough. Premise is a marshal uh, uh, personally <laughs> compelled to face a returning deadly enemy, stands alone as his town refuses to help him. And uh, the, the conceit, one of the conceits of this film is that it is told essentially in real time. Not quite real time, but pretty close. Uh Realish. It's real ish time. time. It's like twenty four season three. Real time. <laughs> I mean, like it's told in time. Some minutes, you know, maybe they have to go to the bathroom. Those are cut. Which did it better, this or Nick of Time? No. <laughs> I don't know if you want to ask me that question. I don't think I want to know. I I already am afraid of where this conversation is headed. <laughs> <laughs> Would this have been better with Johnny Depp in it? Probably. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know what, Andy? It, it's not that I. Let me just tell you. I don't, I'm going to get this out of the out of the way. It's not that I didn't like the movie necessarily, and I find there is a lot of interesting stuff going on. I also found myself really bored, like just bored. The second act is just a slog uh until we get to some of the interesting things going on in the third act i i i just i found it really tough to to stay with it uh during that middle that that barren middle ground of of trying to rally the the town it was it was a snoozer for me um so so i don't rate this movie very high just on in concept i am kind of surprised that it is held up in the esteem of so many critics over the years it doesn't seem to me to be to merit that kind of of uh, affection but uh you know i'm i'm interesting i'm interested in uh, how it hits you well <sighs> It's interesting that you say that because this is a Western that I've always loved. I've always said that I've loved and I haven't seen it that often. Returning to it, I kind of feel the way you do, actually. But I think in the end, despite the fact that I, too, found it rather uh, rather slogging through the second act, I still ended up finding it a fairly strong film. Fairly strong. So, 
All right. Yeah, fairly strong. I mean, here's I I, I think I know where yeah. we're going to part ways, and we're going to st- we're, we're going to start by talking about the the just the script. I think the more interesting thing about this film is the the conversation around how it got made and the the era in which it was made, because I I think it's a it's a fascinating allegory for what was going on at the time, um, and so that's that's one thing. The thing I think we're going to disagree on is Gary Cooper. I doubt it. Really. Yes. Oh, that well then we can be friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. All right. Let's let's dig into it then. So, uh, uh where would you like to to begin? How would you like to begin? Well, I guess we'll start with the story and just kind of the development of it. This was uh, you know, like you said, it's funny that um I, we both read the little bit about uh Carl Foreman kind of coming up with this story. Kind of weirdly the same time that John W. Cunningham came up with the story, The Tin Star, and uh, it just seems like it's one of those instances that today would create lawsuits and all sorts of stuff. But back then, Carl's just like, oh, that's great. Let's just option it and we'll work together and make it all hunky-dory. I, I, <laughs> I tried like... to do a similar thing when I came up with the concept for The Terminator, but Cameron didn't want to play. I was just completely, yeah. you know— Ironic that we would both have that idea. Well, you know why it worked out with Carl Foreman? Because he was a pinko commie bastard. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Somebody (laughs) lit a political fight. Is it because of the caucuses? Have you been watching Iowa and you just got fired up? (laughs) I guess so. Excuse me. Wow. (laughs) Whew. I feel like you got revved up to say that around noon today. You've been holding it in. That's right. Just, just waiting. All right. You were no, saying. No, yeah. This was, um, Carl had uh, been a member of the Communist Party. And um, it ended up kind of uh, biting him <laughs> with the, with this one. This was right around the time this movie was coming out um, and in production. The, uh, the House of Un-American Activities Committee was rounding up people who they thought were communists in the industry and asking them to name names, etc., etc., etc. Carl Foreman had been a communist at one point. I believe it was probably about a decade before uh, before all this happened. But they brought him in to name names, and he pled the fifth, and he kind of ended up getting blacklisted because of it. So this movie kind of has that history there. Interestingly, this film definitely has a vibe of the whole Red Scare and kind of, uh, you know a person getting, you know, all this kind of persecution going on. And uh, it it does have kind of that feel going on in the film. I don't know if Carl intentionally wrote it that way or saw it that way, but it certainly was seen that way by a lot of people in the industry. And uh, yeah, so that that I think led to some people uh, like Hedda Hopper, who I can't remember what her role was. I got to find that. But uh, she was definitely anti anti this film john wayne was anti this film he was one of the people who was really against carl foreman ever working in the industry again and i mean he was blacklisted he moved to england and he never worked in the town again stanley kramer on the other hand um was like well hey i better distance myself from my producing partner and so uh so he did and uh and you know i guess he was able to get the funding and get the movie made so it's just one of those things. It was the time, and it was a scary, scary time. But the movie did get made despite the blacklist, despite everything else. And, uh, um, yeah, pretty uh, interesting way that this thing kind of uh, was It born. is fascinating. And it the, the controversy around how you interpret the film, depending on which side you were on at the time, uh, I, I think is um, it, it's really palpable. Because, you know, from Foreman's perspective— um, you know, it's it's easy to recognize uh, himself, you know, him as Cooper, Foreman as Cooper, the guy standing up to the bad guys, the uh, the House on American Affairs, uh, Affairs Committee, the you know, waiting at the train station, you know, coming to get him. Uh, and, and, you know, the townspeople are the sort of the rest of the populace doing nothing to help support him in a time of need. But, uh, you know, I started reading some uh, counter interpretations. Like, what if you, uh, what if you saw Cooper as the, uh, you know, as the hero Joseph McCarthy? standing up to 
to find uh, the evildoers um, and, uh, uh, you know, in, in McCarthy area as the guy at the House on american Affairs, uh, Affairs Committee, you know, calling uh, to find all the communists in spite of the slings and arrows of the populace. Um, the uh, there was another one that I read about uh, that that saw this film as an anti pacifist film, right? It was a film that you know we we try so hard to uh, you know to to eschew violence, but in the end, violence is the only thing that understands violence. And and in in fact, this film supposedly inspired Dirty Harry uh, with an homage at the end of Dirty Harry of him throwing the star. Uh, into the um, into the pond after he kills uh, Scorpio, so it's a it's kind of an homage to to Cooper's final scene as he throws the star into the dirt and rides off. So I I think that that interpretation is what makes this film interesting. And depending on kind of which side of the uh, of the ring you sit on, um, you, you know it's it it's fun to watch this little puppetry take uh, you know take place on screen. It it's really literal. Uh, you know, it really feels like Foreman had a message, uh, but what that message is 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 makes for fun interpretation. Yeah, and and you could also just look at it as this guy who stands up for his ideals, and in the face of many people, in fact, every everyone basically kind of turning their back on him, and one man is still strong enough to stand up for what he believes in and fight the good fight. Interestingly enough, this film is the most requested film to be viewed by U.S. presidents in the White House. Um, it, um, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton all cited as their favorite film. And uh, it's just interesting that I, I think that story really connects with presidents, probably when they're sitting in the White House and feeling like nobody is uh, on their side. And uh, they're like, they can really connect with the character of Will. Did did you find yourself connecting with the character of Will? I connected enough okay. with it. I mean, I connected enough with it to get a sense of it. But um, you know, talking story, I feel that, like you said, I mean, you already kind of said it. The act, uh, second act, is kind of a slog. It's it spends so much time with uh, Will Kane as he kind of meanders around the town, seemingly kind of kind of aimless, trying to find people to help him out. And I mean, I appreciate I appreciate the scenes that he has where he interacts with the people, but at the same time, it just feels very uh, inactive. And I just like I I feel like there's just there needs to be something more. Well, and I think there. this is the peril of real time storytelling in this case. I mean, that's that is the cost. If if you don't have a reason um, to to stick to that real time trope, my goodness, you you burn a lot of footage. Yes, that's that was the yes. feeling I got. I just didn't feel like there was a a significant reason supporting the story. I I know what I, what I am told. What I'm told is that I'm supposed to appreciate the real time thing because it it is patient. It allows time to unravel for me as I watch this guy's life unfold. It allows me to feel the pressure building up in Cooper's performance of of Kane. Uh, it it allows me to take in the heat. Of, of the film and to to finally when things start to happen in act three to feel that sort of edginess and that kind of explosion that that goes on in the film I, I that's what I'm told and and my reaction to it was uh, just about the opposite yeah I agree all right it's it's interesting because I mean I do like the real-time technique I think it can lend itself well to storytelling um, but here, I, I feel like I feel like it may have been stronger watching it at the time. I think uh, it's one of those things that perhaps the pacing and everything lent itself more to kind of what people were expecting then. Now I feel like uh, you can tell a real time story much quicker. And I mean, twenty four, as outlandish and preposterous as some of the things that they do in that story, um, I think. I think worked pretty well for the modern era. Well, and and I think you know we're we're looking at uh, you know how much we want to be uh, spending time with Gary Cooper. Um, you know, yes. at that point in his career, you know he was a he was an elder statesman of the screen, and um, you know by 1952 he had done 
I don't know, 110 films or something. Like he 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 had uh, a, he was a, a popular dude, and um, and and so I, that might have helped us um, to to be a little bit more patient watching him on screen. And I, I didn't have that patience. I, I certainly don't have that affinity for Gary Cooper. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of jumping over to him, I I like Gary Cooper. But I always kind of find him a little, uh, I don't know what the right word is. I feel like sleepy might may, maybe kind of an apt description yeah. of him. I, I think that he works well in the role, but at the same time, he his presence just feels a little uh, kind of like he's sitting back a little bit. And even then this one, and I can see him, I can see his uh, performance here as a guy who's kind of stoic and and stalwart and you know moving forward because he knows he has to fight the good fight and all of that. I can really sense all of that here but at the same time it still feels a little kind of a little relaxed and for a this this uh sheriff to kind of have that presence, I just don't feel like there's enough of that sense of panic with him. Now he does have a moment where he breaks down. I think it is there. It's so it's it's hard to say because I feel like everything is actually there in this film that shows his his character, but it's just something about Gary Cooper that just kind of makes me feel, you know, a little a little less, I guess. Structurally, you know, what's your uh, I mean we we agree that that uh, uh act 2 is a slog. Uh What's your sense of how Act Three is is structured? I mean, by the time the action hits, how are you feeling? I mean, I actually I really love the structure of the film. I think that they were very bold in telling a western uh, story this way because it was it was very unexpected for the time. People didn't um, they weren't used to a western to kind of unfold in this way where there was so little action. It was really kind of this this character piece that took place. It just happened to be a western. And it all builds to this big action scene at the end. I think that's a fantastic way to tell the story. And I actually really, um, I, I think that Fre- uh, that Fred Zinneman did a good job of building it. I think the tension is there if it wasn't for kind of Gary Cooper and the Act Two slog. Um, I really enjoy kind of the 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 way that it's edited, the cutting toward that stuff. And when you get to Act Three and you have this lead up to this confrontation, as as you've got this final train whistle and the 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 face off, I think that's a great bit. That being said, I also have some real problems with the way that the last uh, bit of the action plays oh, out. I, then I want to hear this because I find, uh, but I, I that's the part, and maybe it's because I just woke up. But one of the things that I like so much about Act Three is the is the 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 face off, the fact that we have a western in this period where there is no um, you know tumbleweed across the road, town cleared out. Uh, we're going to have a face off, but we have our hero who is hiding who is skulking around trying to to find you know his purchase to to get an advantage on these four guys because he's clearly outnumbered and and so the face off takes place in the alleyways and the barns and uh, the the little tiny spaces of this town and i found that really interesting i was i was really moved by it so that you know when the barn is finally lit on fire and he is is forced to jump down and he makes that choice to save the horses because you know save the horses uh he uh, i i really was was interested in how it was going to resolve and that that brought me back into the character a little bit i love all of that too that's not uh, where my problems lie and i i say problems it's it's just a, a, a an element to the final moment that i i uh, struggle with and it's that it becomes so happenstance. It becomes this moment where it really is kind of a, just a luck of the draw. And I understand that that's kind of the nature of what the story is even saying is that, you know, he here is this guy who has to face this incredible obstacle where he's up against four people and will he be able to survive? Odds are no. Somehow, luckily, he survives. And really, it's only because his his new wife, who he's only been married to for an hour, basically reaches up and scratches the guy on the face. Huh. And and for me, I was just like, oh, but, you know, I, I wanted to see something a little stronger. And I know it's just a, a small, petty thing, but I just felt like for my hero to be kind of have that heroic moment, I felt like by having it 
because she scratches the guy, I felt like it just kind of diminished it a little bit for me. All right, I want to make a case. Do it. This whole film has in a, has been about all of the people that are closest to him, who have stood by his side supposedly over the course of his career as marshal of this town. It is about all of them stepping away from him, right, turning their backs. And so we are led to believe through the course of the narrative that that things are not looking good for him, not because he is, you know, he is some weak hero, but because he stands alone, because, you know, success is, is going to come. If it's going to come, it's going to come because he has his friends with him, because he has those closest to him to support him. And as they walk away, we're led to believe that that is some major character deficit, and it's going to be his heroic deficit because he was not able to, to muster support for his cause and and so there's this gaping hole in the end of you know going into this final final scene even his one hour old marriage is at risk for most of the film right she is she says i'm i'm leaving if you pick up guns i'm leaving you i'm a quaker i we don't do guns i can't i don't care there's a better way to do this you're gonna put down your guns and come with me or i am leaving you and uh, hope you live to come find me. So even she is abandoning him. So in that final moment, after he has managed somehow to kill two of these hoodlums and come stand against the final big bad, he wins only as a result of a turn of that particular screw that she is, that, that it is her action that allows him, it's her support that allows him to win the day. That he he couldn't have done it alone, he had to do it with some help, and she was the one who helped him. And I agree completely, except she does it twice. I think that her shooting the third guy worked perfectly for me. That is what exactly uh, you are saying. Yes, she stands with him, and now she has not. She's no longer forsaking him. Oh my darling, she is Don't going to ever do that again. <laughs> she does exactly that yeah but then it happens a second time and that is so that's that is the, the moment it's that second moment where the big bad frank gets her and is holding her in the street and that's what draws will out and so we've got this confrontation and then she reaches up and scratches him in the face that's the only reason that that kind of Frank steps aside and Will kind of is able to shoot him. So really, that structurally, second moment, yes, yeah, structurally, I think that they had it. And had then they we messed had it up. three guys, right? We had three guys, and she helps him kill the last one. It's like there's one too many bad guys. Well, it's not that. It's I mean, I it's I'm totally fine with the four guys. I just somehow she needed to have only one big moment of supporting him. That right. allows she, him to win the day. And instead he had she had two and it diluted the final moment. It it diluted the hero's moment of that of that final sign saying, I am the powerful uh sheriff and I did what I set out to do, even though no one supported me except for my wife. All right. Well, I I still contend for me that doesn't sway me. I still contend that that final team approach actually worked pretty well for me. And and in fact, um, she was kind of a drip, right, Grace Kelly? I mean, she's she's not the most interesting character in this thing. I mean, she looks, she looks like a porcelain doll parading around this hotel and and talking to the guy. And I mean, it's just it, she she looks like she fits the part, but she's kind of a drip of a character until the end, until she actually has her big transformation. And after, uh, you know, 80 minutes of saying she won't pick up a weapon and she doesn't want anybody else to pick up a weapon in her presence, she picks up a weapon. That's a, that's a significant moment. Um, absolutely. And, I mean, she is the change character in this film and I really enjoy her transition. Yes, absolutely. Mostly because for me, it's such a dramatic transformation. Uh, you know, from someone who is not interesting to someone who is interesting, somebody I want to watch for another 20 minutes. Yeah. Maybe not in real time, but... <laughs> uh, so to what do we owe uh, our thanks to director Fred Zinneman? Uh, you know, Fred has a good... I mean, he's he's Polish. He kind of came up in the uh, filmmaking circles uh, working in Germany with Billy Wilder and Robert Siodmak. Um, kind of had this sense of... 
I think it's a uh, kind of a social realism sense in narrative films, and I think he applied that here. He ended up, uh, I think he came to Hollywood in the mid-30s, and um, he, he was a busy guy. He did a lot of stuff. Um, just before this, he did The Men with Marlon Brando as a paraplegic war veteran, and they filmed a lot of that in an actual California hospital with real patients as the extras. Um, I think that he brought that to this film. Um, he worked with his uh, cinematographer, Floyd Crosby. They shot this without filters. They wanted to give the landscape kind of a newsreel sort of look, this real harsh look. Um, they wanted to really do something different than than kind of the big, colorful westerns that John Ford had been doing. That was a big goal of theirs. And I think that that element that Zinneman brought to this is really strong. I think so too. Um, you know, in in that respect, I think he he did a good job of setting of of making use of this town, and of of doing so in a way that really paints a picture of like you know the heat. You know, I, I you know I think I read that they stopped it up, um, you know, two stops to to give it that sort of wide open kind of super bright. Um, uh, feel to it. It makes it feel like it's burning. The sun is just burning down on you the whole time. And I, particularly when we go over to the to the train station, it it feels just barren and suffocating. And I I think the the look of it credit to, you know, uh, Floyd Crosby um, here is just they, they did a great job making use of the feeling of it. Um, and maybe that's why it, that second act is so much more painful. Yeah, I I agree. I, I I mean, there's a lot of fun camera stuff. I like the one that really stuck with me, aside from some great crane shots and and uh, and uh, obvious uh, shots of clocks and stuff. Mm-hmm. But the weird wagon wheel shot. I know. I even drew that. Yeah, I was like, that's a really interesting place to put the camera in a film from 1952. So describe I, it. Describe what we see. Well, you you drew it, so so you describe it. <laughs> uh, well, but, I wrote down what what's up with this crazy wagon wheel shot, and then I didn't draw it, so I don't so, know if I could <laughs> describe it that well. Well, I am a terrible artist, so maybe we're on the same, uh, the same uh, plane here. So it, the the camera is like it's placed on the inner wheel uh, of the sort of driver's side wheel, facing across the wagon looking off the passenger side with the wagon wheel itself spinning, the passenger side wagon wheel spinning, but we are able to see the town. It's kind of an establishing shot early on in the film that allows us to get a picture of the whole town as it's going by, as they're they're riding this wagon out. And so we can see the storefronts. Eventually they come to this cross street turn and we can see like a church in the distance. and, And it is a fascinating way to allow us to explore the town and keep us moving and there aren't many scenes like this and i kept thinking i mean they established this trope for we're going to put the camera in weird places and then they don't really do it they don't really do anything interesting you know that that i can remember certainly nothing that shocked me enough to storyboard it uh for the rest of the film it's all shot sort of maybe high maybe low but generally proscenium and and um feels a little bit staged the, yeah, that one shot was really, it did feel kind of out of place. It's like, that's the most strange shot to kind of put in here. I mean, it is, it's like right on the front of the wagon. Um, I really liked it. I thought it it really set up the energy for that particular moment totally. when kind of all the townspeople are es- essentially watching the sheriff flee is kind of what it feels yeah. like. <laughs> the way that the shot is presented, it's like, he's getting the hell out of Dodge. And so, I mean, I, I did like it. And I... I yeah, it's it's one of those things. I feel like they could have done a lot more playing with the camera. Um, I do appreciate some of the great crane shots and stuff that they use later in the film, particularly the final one when you yes. when you, you know he, he's in the street and it's just that that shot of Will and then the camera pulls up and back, revealing the whole town and it's just him standing on the street alone. I mean, it's just a really stunning shot, beautiful, beautiful shot. But there's not enough of them. As a just as a story point. Um, so I, I sort of feel like this is a, would you get me a sandwich moment, um, in the beginning. So he gets married, uh, he's, he is married by, I don't know, justice of the peace, I guess, in the sheriff's office. Yeah, the judge. Or the judge, right, the judge who also runs away. Um, 
And then he hangs up his gun and he hangs up his his uh, badge. And then they find out that this that Frank Miller is coming back and he's got a grudge. And so everybody says, get out of here. You got to leave. Now, I know that practically if there's a guy crazy enough to come back and, uh, you know, in, in the Wild West to come back and, and uh, you know, hunt you down because you're the guy who put him away, um, you know, he's probably going to find you in your general store that you're managing in some place, you know out in the hinterlands, uh, just as easy as he's going to find you if you're a marshal in this little town in, in New Mexico, Arizona, probably next door uh, to you. I don't know. Yeah, probably. Um, I don't know if they specify, but yeah, Hadleyville. Wasn't it, I mean, isn't it a little bit like, man, you quit your job. You can't come back here and just take the sheriff's badge again and put your gun. You can't do that. That's a human resources, like, uh, nightmare. You quit. <laughs> you already turned in your password. You can't get your email anymore. Terrible. HR disaster. It's the old West man. <laughs> you can do anything. Rules are meant to be broken. You could do anything. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay. What else do you want to talk about? Where were um, we? We were, we, talked we were talking about funky camera movement and Floyd Crosby. Yeah, just uh, um, I think I was at uh, for camera stuff, other than the fact that it was black and white and that, like I said, that was also kind of unique for the time as far as having a black and white western uh westerns people just expect them expected them to be so colorful yeah and uh yeah my only other note i had for floyd crosby the cinematographer is that he's the father of david crosby oh from crosby still there you go in. right that's funny think yeah. of david crosby is so old he had a dad <laughs> <laughs> So we talked a little bit about uh, Gary Cooper already as we get into the cast. He won yeah. Best Actor for this. He did. Yes, he did. And did you happen to, in in irony, did you see the, the uh, uh, did you happen to go back and watch the presentation of the Oscar? I didn't. So you know who presented it? No, who? John Wayne. That is funny irony he stands up and he says uh you know and i i'll put a link to it in the show notes he stands up and he says you know i'm accepting this on behalf of coop you know i, I love coop he's a dear friend he uses the word kinship a lot uh, and then he says now i have to go you know go to my expensive uh agent and managers and and tell them you know ask them why i didn't get uh high noon and cooper did uh, which I think is really funny, given how active he was in getting uh, uh, in, in getting the blacklist going for um, our poor writer. Well, and according to what I read, is that that he had actually been offered the part. So that's which funny. Is, yeah, that's very funny. So, uh, what, any final comments on Gary Cooper? I I don't think he I don't think he should have had the best actor for this. You know, I mean, I can see why they gave it to him. Yeah. It's it's a really strong character. I mean, the sense that he's so stoic yeah. and dedicated to what he believes in. I think that, that it's something that people could connect with. And, I mean, Gary Cooper was a popular actor. People really liked him. I mean, I like him in some of his movies. I, yeah. I think that he works well in a Have good number of them. Have we done any other Gary Cooper movie? I don't remember. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I mean, he's got a very extensive filmography, but I yeah, we should probably still don't dig think. him up in a series at some point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, Mr. Deeds goes to town. I think yeah, that's a that would be uh, the just one. a fantastic one. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just I you know I don't I guess I don't have a whole lot more to say about him. I mean, I enjoy him enough, but I've never really been a a big Gary Cooper lover. Yeah. Uh, Grace Kelly, he was having an affair with Grace Kelly, uh, I believe at the time she was, I think 21 and he was 50. Yeah. It's, that was one of the notes I had is a very strange kind of a romance going on here. I felt she was a little awkwardly young for him. Do you think we'll ever get old enough to be able to understand those kinds of relationships? <laughs> is that the problem? We're not old enough to appreciate <laughs> Maybe an older yeah, man's maybe. dalliance with such a young woman. Yeah, it's because uh, it really it, feels just kind of gross to me. I'm not there yet. No, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I I find uh, Grace Kelly. I mean, aside from just being a, an incredibly beautiful woman, um, I, you know, I think that she she does well in films. I generally enjoy seeing the performances that she does. She didn't do a lot of them, 
she, uh, you know, I, I think she uh, started right around this time. I believe this was her first feature, right? I, I believe so. Yeah, I think that uh, that she was uh, performing on stage when I think it was Stanley Cooper who saw her and, and wanted to put her in this. So, um, but she only acted until uh, you know she was twenty six years old when she married uh, Rainier and became Princess of Monaco. Fourteen and, uh, hours. Who did? Do you remember fourteen hours? I don't. That was a that was a Henry Hathaway film. In uh, 1951, that was her first film. Gotcha. So this gotcha. was her second. Okay. okay Go ahead. Gotcha. You were saying. I was going to say, but she didn't act in a lot of films. I think uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eleven films. Yeah. Not a lot. Yet she left an indelible impression. Oh, rear window, please. Yeah. She worked with Hitchcock three times. So good. Uh, yeah, so she was, I think we've already kind of covered her. I didn't find her all that compelling in this film. She's a young actress, and, and, and until really the end of the third act, um, she's, she's not, not that great. Um, she's certainly beautiful, and, uh, but, but not that compelling or substantive a role. Probably yeah. has something to do with the, just the way the part was written more than anything else. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there are some nice moments with her. I actually do... Um, enjoy her character uh, quite a bit. I enjoy her scenes that she has with the the hotel clerk, who's probably the, the just the creepiest hotel clerk I've ever seen. Um, I enjoy her scenes with Katie Hurado. I think that uh, there's an interesting pairing there, watching the two of them um, together. And uh, I, I kind of enjoy just all of that. I, I think that I may enjoy her a little more, even though I feel like, yes, I agree, the part may have been a little underwritten, especially considering she is the character who we watch kind of transform over the course of the film. Absolutely. And speaking of females and, and Katie Hurado, I I found her pretty compelling. I enjoyed watching her quite a bit. I found her story uh, interesting in this film. And uh, there's enough in there that gave me a sense it was nice having kind of that layered backstory that we didn't necessarily have to go into but there's a lot of stuff going on there um between her and now uh with uh lloyd bridges character i just enjoyed her all through this and i enjoyed seeing such a strong uh latin american actress a uh, latin american character in an old western i enjoyed that, that that was absolutely my comment too i mean in this you know here we are we're still in this era where we just have a dearth of great, strong female roles. And here's one from 1952 uh, that is a strong, layered, nuanced, uh, well-written role for a, a strong actress. And, um, you know, I think she's she's a strong businesswoman and, um, and just an interesting person to to look at and watch her play this role. I think she did a fantastic job. Won some I'd like awards to... for this too, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I'd like to say, you know, she's a strong businesswoman, and she it doesn't have to be running a brothel because that it, seems yes, to be the point. role that they always give women. Yeah, strong like businesswomen in a movie, it's because they're running a brothel in the in the old west. But here, it's like she's just running a business, and she seems to you know be very successful at it. I really enjoy that. Well, running a and, business, and it was so great to see how well the male parts were written on screen with her. You know, I mean, they were in they were. Um, I just think they were watching those guys sit around the table with her and speak to her with such deference about her financial prowess, about how they had, you know, she had come and was staking their businesses in as a silent partner, and and they just treated her with great respect. I mean, you didn't get a feeling that there was a, um, th- that there was any sort of disrespect, any sort of kind of weird sexism going on. It was just a good, strong business relationship. I thought it was great. Yeah. That was really fantastic. She was the first Latin American actress nominated for an Academy Award in uh, uh, 1954 as a supporting actress for Broken Lance. And she was the first to win a Golden Globe in 1952 for this film. Yep. Well deserved. Yeah, well apparently deserved. apparently Stanley Kramer, when he submitted um, for uh, the, the cast for Oscars, he submitted the entire cast as leading players. And so because of that, she was not uh, nominated for Best Supporting Actress. And mm. a lot of people seem to think that uh, Stanley Kramer ba- made a big snafu with that, which I would agree with. I would agree. Uh, who else was interesting to you? 
Um, I think that's really it. Uh, but that being said, uh, Lloyd Bridges pops up here as kind of a, a cranky deputy, and I wish that I, I, I just wish that there was more to his character that really uh, made it makes sense to me. I think that <laughs> the relationship that they had, like the 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 brattiness and whininess of Lloyd Bridges' character about, hey, I wanted to have the job, blah, blah, blah. I just, I, I really didn't connect with that, nor did I really connect with, um, uh, with Gary Cooper's kind of standoffishness with him saying, you know, that he, he didn't, uh, he wasn't going to get behind him or whatever he was saying. It's like, is this really the time to do that? Don't you want to say, hey, whatever it takes to have you come be on my side right now but <laughs> here's my i guess problem. he was standing up for his uh, beliefs i lloyd bridges i you know i like lloyd bridges bridges he's he's a charismatic actor and at, at this point i mean the guy's got you know over 200 credits and uh has been acting a long 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 time and had been acting a long time since since 1936 uh, so by the time he was in this movie, I mean, he'd been on screen for, you know, in some some size screen in some way, shape or form for 20 years. Um, and so I, I think he is cursed with a very grown up voice. And so all I could hear was Lloyd Bridges. Well, I guess I picked the wrong day to quit sniffing glue. <laughs> right? And I, I think that was a problem that I had with him. I never got the sense that he was appropriately um, cast as the bratty young upstart. He just didn't look it. Uh, he looked, I think, too mature, and he sounded too mature for me, and that made his his brattiness way out of context. Uh, leading up to their fist fight in the barn, which seemed really weirdly inspired like why I, I did not understand where that came from at all right i mean he tried and i guess this is what you do when you have a drunk friend uh, in the west and you, he needs to get home like now you might put him if he passes <laughs> out you put him in the back seat of the car and maybe put a bucket under his head and drive him home uh here you punch him in the face and try to lift him up on a horse and just hope the horse knows the way home I guess, and that started a, a fist fight between these two gentlemen in the barn. And and uh, interestingly, I think uh, Gary Cooper was suffering from some kidney problems and was really nervous about actually having this fist fight, but ended up doing it without a stunt person. Uh, and uh, they ended up having a very strange barn fight. Yes, I don't know. Did it strike you as weird? Oh, the whole yeah, the whole thing. All right, the whole good. relationship really kind of. I mean, I, I I pretty much agree with you on all the points. Okay. Um, Thomas Mitchell pops up. Good old Thomas Mitchell. We like him. We sure do. Yeah, this is this is this point where it's like all these other guys are like, I think they have great parts, but they're so minimal in the film. But I, I think that they represent their bits well. Thomas Mitchell, Harry Morgan, Lon Chaney Jr. Um, I, I think all of them kind of represent the different elements of kind of the uh, the excuses that people use to kind of uh, get out of this situation. And we get, I think, one of the very first uh, big screen uh, uh, views of our man Lee Van Cleef. Yes, I believe we do. Uh, and he, I don't think he says anything. No, he doesn't. He just sits <laughs> and plays the harmonica. <laughs> I, there was word, did you read this too? I, I may be remembering this incorrectly, that at some point he was actually... Uh, he was actually going to play one of the bigger roles. I don't know if it was Cooper, but it had it, the the word was he was relegated to one of the goons because his nose was too hooked. Right? Did you read that? I did read that. Yeah, that's a tough thing to be saddled with in 1950. Yeah, a hooked nose. Pretty, you can't do anything. What are you going to do? It's uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty painful to read. But yeah, yeah, he was originally cast as the deputy as uh, as um, uh, Lloyd Bridges' part. That's right. That's right. Lloyd Bridges part. We love him in uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Um, well, we've talked about him a couple of times. Yeah. Escape yeah. from New York. Escape from New York. That's right. Uh, who else? Sheb Woolley is another one of the another one of the goons. And uh, I mean, we've talked about Sheb on something. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, but uh, yeah, he's just one of those uh, character actors and kind of uh, singers that kind of pops in and out. Oh, Outlaw Josie Wales. That's, that's what it right. was. Yeah. And then I just had a little note that uh, Jack Elam makes an uncredited appearance in here. Jack Elam is a very recognizable face, and uh, especially if you've seen um, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, he's one of the three 
uh, guys at the very beginning of the film who are waiting for the guy to arrive at the train station. And uh, he just has it just his face just is kind of just its own special thing. I really enjoy his face, but he's the drunk yeah. in the in the drunk tank that he kind of uh, boots right before uh, before Will goes out onto the streets. He's so crazy. He, he just is, as he, he aged, has that... he just got so crazy. His face. Yes, yes, it did. It's wow. the eyes. The yeah. eyes just <laughs> took on a life of their own. Oh dear. All right, we've got to talk about this music. Yeah, Dimitri Tiomkin and his uh, his uh, double Oscar win for this movie. Oh goodness! I don't necessarily disagree with that. Um, but that being said, and I actually yeah, like the, score, the song. The score, the score is actually quite good. I, I like the score and I like the song. Oh. But man, is the song just constant in this film to the point where it's like. I mean, I haven't been able to stop whistling it, singing it, and everything. And even my daughter started singing it. And just like <laughs> she, she sat in the living room for like three minutes, and she happened to hear it. And it's just it, it's it, it definite is an earworm. It's uh, I, you know, it's to the point where I, I probably at one point liked it. I don't like it anymore. I can't. I, it's too. Mu- it's just too much. They use it so terribly in this film. Um, you know, it, it and it tells the story. Of the film, right? It's a it's a fable song. It's a folk song that tells the story of of um, you know it through this ballad. It tells the story of the of you know Cain well, essentially. Yes, right? right. It's Cain's story, yeah. kind of almost as if he's singing to his wife, who has forsaken him. Yeah, right. Because of this whole thing. But my goodness, they use it so much. Well, I think it's an interesting thing in reading up on it. I think that. Um, it, it sounded like kind of it was a, a, a Russian thing that Tiomkin may have have pulled and, and um, just a thing of like centering the score around this single ballad. Um, I, and, you know, I mean, I think that it, uh, it works in context of the story. But yes, it is very incessant. Interestingly, the thing that I think is most fascinating about the song is that really in a large way, the song is what really actually saved uh, this movie and actually got this movie out into theaters. What happened when the movie kind of had its opening preview, it didn't do very well. And the people just kind of felt the picture fell flat. And so what Tiomkin did is he actually bought the rights to the song, released it as a single uh, with singer Frankie Lane singing the song. The record became a huge hit. And because the song was so popular, the studio said, okay, well, let's put this film out there. And they had Tex Ritter uh, sing the song, and they they kind of incorporated it into the film like that. And that is really, in a large part, why this film ended up becoming the success that it was. Wow. That's actually, that's an interesting story. Yeah, I I find that really fascinating. And then, yeah, Tiomkin, I think a lot of it hinges on the popularity of the song at the time. Um, ended up winning two Oscars. He won the, the original score and the song for this film. You imagine uh, being able to just go buy the rights to a song in a film right now just to try and make it more popular? <laughs> I'd love to hear that story these days. I know. I, it's I, it's not something that can happen anymore. Talk about an arcane well, concept. Yes and no. I think what would happen now, I think now with social media and stuff, you have people have different avenues to kind of do things like that. And they yeah. can put things out there. Um, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but Harry Gregson Williams, who wrote the score for The Martian, he actually ended up like you can, like his ads are all over Facebook right now. I, I get them like every day hitting me up about, hey, all these unreleased tracks of The Martian, come check them out. Oh, and you no can go kidding. Listen. Yeah, and so it's it's interesting. So I think that there are ways for people to still do that, and it's probably part of his his push in a way to kind of win an Oscar for his music because I know he was nominated. Oh, that's fascinating, actually. That and and it makes me want to check it out. We should yeah, put a link right. in the show notes. I'll have to uh, click on the ad next. Yeah, time would you click on the ad next time? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry to charge you the click, man. But yeah, yeah uh, right. <laughs> anyhow, it's all good. It's all good. All right, so uh, this leads us back to the uh, Oscars. It did not win Best Picture. No, it was kind of the odds-on favorite for Best Picture, uh, but uh, the critics certainly loved it. But um, 
you know, Hedda Hopper and her team, they uh, really kind of came out in force against the film. And she really kind of pushed um, adamantly that uh, that The Greatest Show on Earth should win, which was the biggest moneymaker of the year. It made at least $5 million more than any other, of, of the other movies. Um, it, uh, it did really well for itself. Cecil B. DeMille, I mean, he's definitely a filmmaker of spectacle. But, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but it is a terrible film. And uh, the fact that it ended up winning Best Picture, I think, is just a joke. So, I mean, had a, had a Hopper and her team, they got it to win. And uh, I think that the fact that this film and Singing in the Rain are the two films that are really most remembered from 1952 says a lot. What do you think of Moulin Rouge? Do you remember the original? I well? never have actually seen that one. Jose Ferrar? Nope, haven't seen it. It makes me want to go back and see that again. Well, and all of them, frankly, because, and again, if I'm going to make a statement, I just don't, I, I was not entranced by Gary Cooper as best actor, but Marlon Brando, Kirk Douglas, uh, and strangely, <laughs> Moulin Rouge, uh, did you see this? So the the other nominees, according to Oscars.org for 1952 for best actor were Alec Guinness, Kirk Douglas, Marlon Brando, Gary Cooper, and Moulin Rouge. <laughs> They, they forgot the actor's name? Right. That's, I guess, Moulin That's Rouge really for the film Moulin Rouge, Yes, which seemed very strange. We don't to speak me. the name Jose Ferrer. We don't, we don't speak the name. <laughs> you will not be named. Uh, yes. <laughs> you will not be named. Oh, no, we said his name, <laughs> We Pete. said his name. <laughs> Anyway, I I mean I love Alec Guinness in Lavender Hill Mob. I thought he was great. There's I, no way you I, get it. It was too too goofy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's been so long since I've seen The Bad and the Beautiful. I don't know if I could say about Kirk Douglas, and I haven't seen the other films. So, um, yeah. I mean, again, I can see why they would give Gary Cooper an Oscar. I think that uh, there's strength in the character, um, and I think that's really I think that's why he won. All right, and and Best Picture. I mean, I honestly up against the greatest show on earth. Ivanhoe, Moulin Rouge, and The Quiet Man. I haven't seen Ivanhoe or Moulin Rouge, but I would definitely pick High Noon of that trilogy. Yeah, maybe you're right. And I I mean, you know, I don't know if it's just... I'm not a huge John Ford fan. Um, I don't know all the hate mail I'll probably get for saying that, but it's true. Um, Cecil B. DeMille, John Huston, uh, Joseph L. Mankiewicz, and Fred Zinneman for the best director. John Ford took it for The Quiet Man. And, you know, I, that's not one of uh, the Ford films that I'm a big fan of. Um, I also would probably have gone with Zinneman. Yeah, well, maybe. Jeez. I don't know. I'm feeling I'm feeling awfully Houston tonight. I just haven't seen it. So, yeah, I'm curious to see that one. All right. The, um, uh, but uh, best script, I... I remember thinking The Bad and the Beautiful was a pretty strong script, so I might pick that over High Noon. Um, although you might pick The Man in the White Suit. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I Roger thought McDougall, so. Alexander McKendrick. Yeah, that's a pretty it's a pretty great script as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else that we need to cover before we get into the numbers? I think that's it. Let's let's do it then. How did it do? Uh, this film, well, it uh, you know it did well for itself. It cost about, from what I found, about seven hundred thirty thousand dollars, which is about six and a half million in today's dollars. You know, kind of small uh, western. It ended up making domestically about twelve million dollars. So uh, that's a that's a hefty bump. Mm -hmm. That's about one hundred and five million in today's dollars. So yeah, this film did well for itself. It uh, ended up making about one point one. A million per finished minute. All right. I think we should probably rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel, and you can see our list of our favorite films. And we have, well, we have plenty of them uh, now. I think, what is our list up to as of this one? 220 something? 222. This would, be, this would be 223, yep. Wow. Well done, list of movies. <laughs> And uh, and then once you set up an account there, you can uh, you can pick this one. Just search for High Noon and then just start ranking and see how it stands up. And and uh, as you start to build your own flick chart list, uh, here we go. All right, High Noon or the Bad Seed. Oh, I, I think, High Noon. Uh, really? Yes, there. 
Yeah, I know. You're probably There's right. a lot more to this story than You're the bad right. Scene. We had some problems with the bad. All right, let's do High Noon. I mean, despite my problems, I will say I still really did like High Noon. Yeah, I and I did too. I think I'm I'm going crazy. I'm Go ahead. Yeah. High Noon or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. High Noon or The Killing. The Killing. Yeah, I think I would now do The Killing. I think before this viewing I would have put High Noon higher. Yes, I do too, on reputation alone. Yeah. High Noon or Thank You for Smoking? Oh, Thank You for Smoking. Thank You for Smoking, yeah. High Noon or Chronicle? I I really enjoy Chronicle. There's a lot going for it, but I will pick High Noon. Really? Yep. Why? The story. I think that there is real strength in the story of this one man having to stand alone. And I think uh, that is what I go back to. Like I said, despite my problems, I still go back to this this powerful story. And I think it's a, a real um, touching uh, display of commitment. So you're telling me side by side, you're sitting down and you've got the Blu-rays. And you're saying, I'm not okay, saying I'm, that. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm watching a movie. I'm going to put on either. These are the only two films you have. And you're going to put, put on Chronicle on first. Yeah, me too. But that's not the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think High Noon is the better film, but I I would put Chronicle on first. See, I would put Chronicle on first, and therefore I will pick Chronicle. All right, well, we're going to have to flip for it. All right, let's do it. One, One, two, two, three. three. Rock. Paper. What was that? Skype delay, dude. I had no... uh, I'm sure if you didn't hear it, I said it. I'm kidding. You can have High Noon. Oh, you're giving it to me now? You w- you would have won that anyway, and I cheated. <laughs> All right, High Noon or the Lavender Hill Mob? Hey, Lavender Hill Mob. I, yes, there Lavender is justice. <laughs> High Noon or Creep Show? I know. I will do Creep Show. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it for real now. All right, one, one, two, two three, three, scissors. Paper. Oh, that's okay. It it is the better film. <laughs> I will willingly admit that. Hi, okay, and then uh, back to Lavender Hill Mob. We already picked that one. So there you go, 103. So, you know, right. it, I think that's a fair spot for it to land. I do too. That's probably just about right. It's a classic, but it didn't break the top 100. That's right. All right. Well, uh, what does that do for our star rating? This is uh, a film that I do have problems with, but like I said, I find a lot of strength in it, and I still am going to give it a four star. It was a five star, and because of my problems with this viewing, I'm dropping it a star. I uh, I'm a three star on this one. All right, that's fair. Uh, so there we are, Andy. Where do we go from here? Well, as you know, this is movies and their remakes series. So we're going to be doing the remake. Interestingly, uh, there are a number of remakes of this film. It was, uh, let me find that list again. It was remade uh, in 1966 as a TV pilot called The Clock Strikes Noon Again, set 20 years after the original movie. <laughs> not, he couldn't come up with a better, a better name than that. That's terrible. It is, it is the worst sequel name ever. It really is. Uh, yeah, Peter Fonda played Will Kane Jr., who goes to Hadleyville after Frank Miller's son kills his father. And oh, so, uh, yeah, it, it sounded pretty terrible. There was a made-for-TV sequel called High Noon Part 2, The Return of Will Kane with Lee Majors and Catherine Cannon. <laughs> Interestingly, written by Elmore Leonard. I know, that's so good. <laughs> Makes me want but, to read the screenplay. Right, exactly. Um, there was a 1987 high school comedy called Three O'Clock High, which I will say is an incredibly wonderful guilty pleasure of mine. I have not seen it, but but once you put it in high school, oh my gosh, the bullying movies and stories that borrow heavily from High Noon are a plenty. Yes, definitely all over the place. But no, we're going to be talking about the 1981 science fiction film Outland, starring Sean Connery. And you still have not seen this film. I still have not seen it. All right. I'm very excited to hear what you have to say about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, especially now that I've watched this again and, you know, have some issues. I'm curious to see how this kind of deals with it. Sean Conray, Space Cop. Yeah. That just makes me laugh when you say that. <laughs> I hope I can take this movie seriously. <laughs> 
Don't you forsake me, oh my darling. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying the same song. It's in this. I did. I wouldn't have seen that coming. That's hilarious. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited about it. And, uh, you know, we should also say uh, between now and then, we do have another film board, our February film board, uh, backing up our January film board one week later. Uh, we're going back to the Coens. I'm actually excited for this film, The Coen Brothers, another comedy from The Coen Brothers, Hail Caesar, opens this weekend. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing a Coen Brothers with the Gang of Thugs. I am too. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, it's got a great cast. I uh, I think it's going to be fun. I, it's a February opening, though. That's the thing that makes me a little nervous about it. I know. Because it can be hit or miss. Dry spell. Yep. All right, Andy. I got to go to bed. All right. I got to go beat my head against a wall until I stop singing this damn song. <laughs> Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon, there's there's a wealth of reviews from Amazon. I have one uh, from Andrew left in January, or I'm sorry, June of the year 2000. Why? And it was not me. No, it was not you uh, because he was, uh, Andrew was watching this on VHS tape and everybody knows that you were on Laserdisc. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Sorry. Hey, it's been 10 minutes. Flip the disc. <laughs> Put in disc nine. <laughs> Andrew says, I watched this movie with great anticipation. However, I was so disappointed. There was no plot. And Gary Cooper, a fine actor, gave one of the worst performances ever recorded on film. Maybe a touch hyperbolic. Maybe. But Rush had not been made yet. The one bright spot in this movie was Grace Kelly, and I wish this film hadn't been re-edited, which cut a lot of Grace Kelly out. The title song, which won the Oscar, is played incessantly, which caused it to lose whatever quality or charm it had. Overall, this movie was so utterly boring and inane that it is one of the greatly overrated films of all time. Of its time. I would love to know where Andrew got his information about the... uh... The all the footage of Grace Kelly that had been cut yeah, out. I've I, never, I didn't come across that story anywhere. I did not either. None hmm. of it. There you go. Poor Andrew did not like it. Not I at should all. add, he's he didn't prove his uh, review. <laughs> no, he did not. No, he did not. No. Uh, my review is by Matt, also in two thousand, who said, "Hi, swoon." <laughs> kind of makes you think he might like it, although it's actually a one star review. He says, High Noon, the greatest Western of all times? Please. The plot is ludicrous. An entire town quivering behind closed doors in the Old West. Hardly. Every family in that era had a rifle, shotgun, and pistols, and were more than willing to use them. Remember Coffeeville, Kansas, and the Dalton brothers? Now those Dalton boys were a true criminal crew. Unlike these pansy thugs who arrive in town to murder Cooper and who fail miserably in their attempt. In the Old West, these props for criminals would have been shot down a.k.a. bushwhacked, in quick order by the good citizens. America then, and the Old West, had plenty of guns and were willing to use them. In this film, the town should have turned their armaments on Cooper, who acted as if he were already dead. Tex Ritter, who sounded as if he were dying during his hideous singing, and the casting director, who selected Cooper, worn out and depleted, as the geezer who would plunder the breathtaking Grace Kelly. No wonder she left the country. And any of the other cast who participated in this ordeal. Some of that was just kind of mean. <laughs> it was really mean, but I found it really funny. Wow. <laughs> they should have turned their arms on Cooper? Yeah. Woo! That's grim, man. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you. 
and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season five had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. You see what I <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin III with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wrights series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. 